s'mores, I'm Shannon Morris. Welcome to Morse Code. I do tech reviews and tutorials. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Oh my gosh, I am bringing iOS onto Morse Code. What happened to Shannon Morse, the Android girl? Well, I still am. You know, I just spent the past week just kind of reintegrating myself into this operating system. And it was a really interesting experience coming from Android devices for almost the whole past decade. So that will be a whole nother video. Today, we are focusing on the new iPhone 12 Pro Max, which I unboxed on the 13th when I got it from the Apple store. And I have been using it as my daily driver ever since. So unlocked, it starts at 1099 MSRP for 128 gigs with 256 gigs at 1199 or 1399 for the 512 gig model. I ended up going with Pacific Blue with 256 gigs. So the phone does come in four different colors. That includes graphite, silver, gold, and my pick, which was Pacific Blue. It's got this ceramic shield front a textured matte glass back, and it's got a stainless steel design and frame. So what does that mean? Well, the front glass is better at withstanding drops and falls without cracking, but it does scratch pretty easily. So I have been babying mine while I waited for a screen protector to come in. The matte glass back is pretty fragile as well, and the stainless steel does scratch pretty easily. So it's a fragile phone. It's a phone that decidedly needs to go in a case just to keep it in its pristine condition. Since I do like the color, I think the blue is really beautiful. I think that it has a really nice hue to it. Whenever the light bounces off of it, I think it's really pretty. I could use a glass back protector or a clear case to show it off, and that's probably what I will most likely do. Volume buttons and the silent slider are on the left side, and then the power button is on the right side. There's stereo speakers that are found at the top within the notch and the bottom next to the lightning port. I do like how the buttons are situated and they feel really high quality very responsive with a nice tactile click. The speakers are loud and they are very clear and they're also even. The top one sounds just as loud as the bottom one, which can be an issue on some phones. Watching videos, listening to music was very pleasant. It didn't seem too heavy on the highs or treble frequencies. There was a little bit of bass that came through, more than what I could say for most of the Android phones that I have also tested. Now the Pro Max weighs a little over eight ounces, which means that it weighs less than the Z Fold 2, but it's also heavier than any of the other phones that I have in hand this year. It's also bigger at 6.33 inches by 3.07 inches by 0.29 inches. Though I will note the size of the 12 Pro Max is pretty similar to the Pixel 3 XL, which my husband has. So when I held it, even with my smaller hands, I thought, oh, this is not as bad as I thought it would be. I felt like it's pretty normalized now. I've already held phones of similar size, so this form factor is not out of the question for me, but I would not put a bulky case on it. I would rather keep it as slim as possible because I already have to use two hands whenever I am using it. Now, FYI, the 12 Pro Max and the 12 Pro for that matter as well are both IP68 water splash and dust resistant. So that means six meters at 30 minutes. So I do feel better about using this whenever I'm washing dishes or whatever than I do with the Fold 2, which is not protected whatsoever. The display on this one is gorgeous, and that's one of those things that Apple is known for. Like previous iPhones, it has that Super Retina XDR display, but it is also quite big at 6.7 inches, and it's an OLED display. It packs in 458 pixels per inch at a 2778 by 1284 pixel resolution. Now, I rarely find myself ever wanting the phone at max brightness since it does hit 800 nits or 1200 with HDR, that's brighter than most of the phones that I have tested. I usually keep it around 50% brightness, but I just leave it on auto and let it do its thing. I am digging the true tone and the night shift settings to keep the blue light from the screen at a minimum at night. So I leave those settings on. I feel like it looks a lot more natural. This does make the screen a little bit more yellow in tint, so you can turn it off in the settings, but I don't mind it since I prefer to sleep better over having a blue tint screen. Now, even though the display is 60 hertz, Apple has made the interface really smooth, very fluid, and that was a thing that a lot of people were wondering about. So whenever you're zipping around from one place to another or from app to app, you forget that it is set at 60 hertz. And I can't say the same for Android phones whenever I'm going from 120 hertz down to 60. I do wish that scrolling was a little faster, though the continuous scrolling is really nice. The notch is painfully obvious if you are coming from a 
iPhone without one. If you're used to the notch, you won't mind. The screen is definitely not edge to edge. There is a black border around the whole thing, but I turned on dark mode and I noticed that that really helps with the noticeability. Now, Apple has an A14 Bionic chip made by Apple, which makes for a very fast phone. Face ID on here is basically the best. I have not experienced anything that matches it on Android phones quite yet. It is very fast, responsive. It works well with all of my secure apps, like my password manager. I like that I have to be aware for it to work. So if my eyes are closed, it does not unlock the phone. And I also noticed it doesn't work with a um, Rona face mask or with a Korean facial mask. So keep that in mind. Don't forget your password. I think I'm going to do another video about security, basically comparing Android versus Apple in a comparison video. I think that would be really important and a good video to do because that could be an entire segment on its own. Now the same could be said for general usage. The phone is quick and zoomy. Everything from FaceTime to maps to social media usage was all really comfortable to use, though I found myself getting kind of frustrated at little things that I somewhat take for granted on Android that iOS just does not do, like having icons at the top for your notifications instead of the persistent bars in a separate notification display, or using your power button as a power button. But I jest, and that's basically just iOS. But if you're coming from iOS, if you've been using it for a very long time, then those are things that you're not really going to be bothered by. My Slingshot Extreme 3D Mark score was 5493. That is lower than my Samsung Fold 2 and the S20 FE, but it is higher than my Pixel 5. I played some Pokemon Go on it and it was very fluid, very flawless, and I had no issues playing video games on it. The only time I noticed Freezing is whenever I'm using the Google search widget, which widgets on iOS. <laughs> whenever I start typing in something into the search bar, it freezes for several seconds before it actually lets me go ahead and finish that process. Hopefully I can get this on video because it's really frustrating. Now video like audio is top notch for the phone. It includes perks like Dolby Atmos, HDR with Dolby Vision, both of which I have started digging into because I recently got an LG CX 4K TV so I can actually watch this kind of content and yes, it does look look amazing. And I really need to give props to Apple for the haptics on this phone. The vibrations that you feel whenever you do things like typing on a keyboard or changing a setting or editing your home screen. The haptic engine in here is so good. It's not obtrusively jolting whenever it's kept enabled and it gives you just enough of a physical feedback to know that you are making changes and those are being saved. It's kind of like sin ack in the phone world. Uh, if you know what that means, comment below. Now let's talk charging. I did get a MagSafe charger to use with it and a 20 watt AC adapter for the MagSafe charger and the phone. Now, while the phone comes with a lightning to USB-C cable, it doesn't come with a USB-C wall wart. So you do gotta buy one or use one if you have one laying around, which I know that none of my family does. None of them do because they have like iPhone sevens and eights. None of them own 11s, so they don't have USB-C wall warts. But my feelings about right to repair and Apple saying that it's for the environment, please. <laughs> that can be a whole nother video in itself as well. The MagSafe works fine with the 12 Pro Max. It does magnetically click into place. It kind of leaves this mark from the rubber on the back of the phone that you can just wipe off with a cloth. It doesn't leave any scratches, so you don't have to worry about that. I do find that this thing is useful since on other pads, the iPhone kind of has a hard time finding the right placement to charge. I do use the lightning cables with my USB-C adapters pretty often since I don't want to buy like four MagSafe chargers for placement all over my house. And I do use this with the cheese stands that I've already got, even though the charging through third-party cheese stands is so slow, it doesn't even hit 100% overnight. And to me, that's terrible. But luckily the battery on this thing is incredible. It's a 3687 milliamp per hour battery, which does not sound huge in itself, but I did try to kill it. And I do try to kill it every single day. But my best day so far was when I started at 100% percent in the morning and I was able to get it to 30 percent with over eight hours of screen on time which means even though I had it on for eight hours I still had 30 percent left so it only went through 70 percent of the battery to me that's insane that's the best battery performance I have ever had in a phone in recent years I just wish that it did 10 watts on a third-party cheese stand that would be great. 
And then we have 5G. Now, while I haven't had a chance to take this phone to a 5G area yet, I live just outside of one, Denver is entering another lockdown, so I don't necessarily feel safe going to a place that has a lot of people. It does have excellent coverage for calls, GPS navigation, and regular usage, which I have taken it in the car with me plenty of times to go to the grocery store. I use it with Google Fi for testing, and the reception is so good. It does accept dual SIM, a nano sim and eSIM. Now, since I am choosing to play it safe, I will update with 5G speed tests via my Twitter, which is at snubs spelled S-N-U-B-S. Now let's talk about the cameras. We have to talk about the cameras. On the back, you've got three lenses. Each of them are 12 megapixels. The first is an ultra wide at F2.4 aperture and 120 field of view. The second one is your wide camera at F1.6 aperture, and that's your default camera. The third one is the telephoto lens, which is f2.2 aperture. You do get 2.5 times optical zoom in, two times optical out, and five times optical zoom range with 12 times digital zoom on the Pro Max and increase from the Pro. There's a few extra features like different lighting modes for portraits, panoramas, slow-mos, time lapses, but I'm usually just using it for the regular photos and video. I am impressed by how well that it can use ambient light to keep the photo in focus and keep things like the detail and my cat's fur in focus. Colors are definitely natural. They are not saturated like crazy, although yellows do tend to pop out a little bit more. And I do appreciate how fast the shutter is. It's kind of hard to get a photo of my dog without it being blurry, but this phone's shutter speed is fast enough to capture that. And it has enough light to keep her details there, even though she has dark fur. Portraits are also lovely, but I honestly prefer the aperture of the wide camera at 1.6, which is the default. It looks much more natural compared to the cutout that you get with portrait mode. I haven't gotten a chance to use the new LiDAR scanner for night mode portraits yet because, you know, Rona keeps me home all day. It's kind of hard when you don't have a photographer to take pictures of you with this camera lens. Maybe I should get my husband to do that. I did get to take this out and get some photos at night though, and overall I do think that it's quite good. Night mode can be used on both the ultra wide and the wide lenses, and for more photography examples, check out my Twitter. The wide lens uses sensor shift optical image stabilization and it also looks awesome. Here's a test video that I did. What did you do? Suki? Suki, what did you do? <laughs> you killed it. Oh my god, it's dead. You killed it. You killed the lamb chop. Oh my god. Yeah, it's dead. Here's a little test video on the iPhone 12 Pro Max showing the stabilization. I am recording at 4K 24 FPS, and we are going to see how it looks, how it sounds, as well as how the OIS turns out. Look at that beautiful tree. It's so lovely. All right, we're gonna take this a step further. I am currently experiencing an earthquake in my hand. So we're gonna see how well the OIS works as if I'm moving around way too much for a shot. Honestly, if you do this, don't take video. It won't turn out well. Now, FYI, on that last video that I took, I was shaking the shit out of this thing, trying to make it look like I was shivering, and it did an excellent job of stabilizing the content, so very impressive. Videos can be recorded up to 4K 60. HDR recording with Dolby Vision up to 60 FPS is also included. There is no 8K shooting, which does come in some Samsung phones, but it looks good. The audio sounds really good. It's no wonder so many YouTubers just use an iPhone to record their videos instead of a fancy DSLR like I do. You can also take eight megapixel photos while recording video, which is a nice perk. Now the front camera, which is called the true depth camera, is a 12 megapixel camera at f2.2 aperture. You can use Apple's Animoji and Memojis, night mode, portrait mode, similar effects. Recording offers up to 4K 60 as well. All right, I am recording a handheld shot on the front facing camera, 4K 24, just to see how it does with image stabilization and see how well it does with my audio as well. Look, there's a little dog down there. Hi, Suki. Hi, Suki. Suki. Hey. <laughs> 
If you've got sunny backlighting, the background is really blown out. Portrait mode gives me similar photos to the portrait quality on the front, and it does have trouble with my hair. Colors are a little bit saturated in the selfies, and it does smooth my skin a little bit, but not to the point to make me look airbrushed. So you may listen to this and think, wow, she hates Apple or hates iOS, which I don't. I kind of love it. Isn't that weird? Apple made a solid phone and the camera capabilities are excellent. Are they best in class? I would say that's a preference. Some things it does great while others like portraits, it does not. I am excited to compare it against the Pixel camera as that's my favorite from the Android department. The Apple ecosystem is tough to get into if you are coming from an Android lifestyle. But luckily, everything that I want is available. So it's just kind of a learning curve, which I am willing to lean into because Google is my friend. And when I say that, I mean searching on Google is my friend. But it is a big phone. It is huge. To me, coming from a Fold 2, it is fine. But for other people, I can fully understand why you might look at this and think, uh, it's too big for me. But if you don't need all the bells and whistles of the camera, the 12 model or the 12 Pro even would probably do you just fine. I am surprised that I was not disappointed by the 60 Hertz display, but that's thanks to the Fluid UI, which Apple is great at. And the battery is so good. Good. Does this make me an Apple girl? No. In fact, there's a lot of things that I don't like about iOS, but that's going to be a different video. Comment below and let me know if you would buy it. Thanks again so much to my s'mores for subscribing and watching. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you soon. Bye, y'all.